I want to start today's video with that site right there. You probably don't know, but we've been stuck in rain for two days here in Florida, so I'm out getting a hike, and I had that view, and I thought, man, i got to get that on the video. Look at that scraggly tree. I'm going to kind of walk it across so that you can enjoy that view. So we're going to get back to my conversation about why I'm the most qualified person on the planet to write the ultimate cybersecurity guide, or the book, The Internet is Infected, The Ultimate Cybersecurity Guide for Small Business and Home Computing. So and we're going to talk just a wee bit about the book today. Enough of that. At least this time I got the sun <laughs> in front of me. I noticed in a previous video that the, uh, the, the everything was glistening. I mean, you know, it was like, oh man, I should, I got to remember to walk into the sun when I make the video instead of away from the sun. Anyway, so we're going to get to the book. Let's just talk about the book just a second because it's soon going to be free to everybody at this organization. I'm not going to say because I don't want to give it away. It's going to be a surprise. And, uh, and of course, you know, really it's free to everybody because you can join the organization for free. That's what I want to do. I want to help the organization out. I'm trying to encourage you to join. So we'll, we'll do that after the interview. Uh, but let's talk about the book for just a second. So maybe you don't want to learn about uh, computers or cybersecurity or any of that. Well, as, as I did a reading uh, yesterday, I, I, I write a lot of history into the book, the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, the uh, uh, stories about myself, whether you got, they're pretty entertaining. Let me tell you, when, when you can sit down and really write about it and think about everything that happened, uh, then of course uh, uh, we've got you know Pickett's Charge in the book. Uh, now, one of the most interesting stories in the book, and the reason that it, it, it delayed me being able to uh, publish the book was Edward Snowden. There's no other book, I can guarantee you, that details everything that he revealed Secondhand knowledge, of course. I, if I could ever get that interview with Edward Snowden, I would love to verify everything I have in the book. But I was, uh, I was following along. You know, he revealed five different spying programs, and of course, other vectors of attack like Dropbox and the uh, uh, things that I didn't know about. And of course, I documented his entire journey and how he thwarted the uh, the government authorities. You know, all the techniques that he used. Uh, his cybersecurity techniques. So if you're ever on the run, you're a criminal. <laughs> you might want to read my book because I teach you how to do it, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, so if you just wanted to get the book just to learn and follow along with his story, uh, you know, I could break that out and just turn it into a separate book. And of course, I plan to do that. I just didn't know how much censorship that I had working against me, and I had no way to market the book. So, I mean, because I wanted a one book, you know, fits everything, and then I was going to break it up into uh, at least a three-volume set, probably, you know, break the whole Edward Snowden story out into in one book by itself, you know, which maybe we'll do that. If people uh, find that they, you know, download my book and they get interested, I'll go back and put some work into it. But unless I get some interest, uh, you know, I'm not going to do it, or unless we can get it out. I think there's interest. I just, we got to get it out to people so that they can they can watch it so enough on the book let's let's get up to why i was the most qualified person on the planet to write about individual and small business cybersecurity. so so now i'm moving on to the next job if you recall i left off at jp morgan chase and uh so what had happened was the uh data center uh in the in the twin towers and uh they had gone down and J.P. Morgan had to replace a data center. Now, if you've ever seen a bank data center, it's massive. I mean, it's massive. And we're going we're gonna to get into a little story about the NSA here uh, at, later on in the video. So you might want to just hang around for that. But anyway, so uh, I was real excited. This is a this whole new facet of the computer industry. Okay, I have never, ever, you know, uh, I've certainly racked servers and, you know, and done l little stuff. You know, never on on a colossal scale. I never worked in switch technology with the Cisco switches. You know, there I've never worked. You know, been able to fluke fiber to test fiber or test uh, coax cables. They had all the testing equipment, all the fluke gear. I mean, it was. You know, imagine a guy coming in who doesn't know squat about any of this stuff, 
and you know they hired me because they obviously there's another facet to the job where you got to have the computer skills there's just not any you know where are you going to go uh, in the United States and pull somebody off the street and say okay you've worked in a data center racking stacking servers racking stacking switches running fiber you know running cable loading operating systems you're the guy and there's not many people out there like that so they're gonna have to bring you bring in somebody who's got one quarter of the knowledge that is needed for the job and then teach them the other three quarters and so I was all you know I was still wanting to learn his you know I'm you know I was a hired gun I always wanted to learn well, anyway, the job at first wasn't what I was expecting. Because <laughs> I, mean, I, I was on the night shift. You, you work uh, in a data center, you work 12 and a half hours a day. Uh, and it was if, that was another thing that appealed to me. You're three days on, four days off, four days on, three days off. And so that gave me the ability to go camping and do a lot of the things that I like to do, you know, in, in between my shifts. Uh, so, you know, so it's pretty cool. But I tell you what, working midnight till noon the next day, that is brutal and what happens is everybody comes in you know later on when the data center really got rolling everybody comes in at seven o'clock in the morning you know or eight o'clock or nine o'clock and you've been working all night long you know busting buns i mean that was a tough job man and a lot of it's physical labor and uh and they're all coming in and they you know you they're wanting to know what happened you know because there's always something that happens you know this this server went down or this this computer broke or you know the fiber connection wouldn't connect you know and and so you you know you, you're tired as hell and you know management's sitting down and you got to be able to, to communicate everything to them you got to document everything all night long which is another skill that you have to know how to do but anyway so a, a funny story about the beginning of the job so i was working with this guy I won't give you his name because he might someday watch a video. <laughs> he might come and shoot me, you know. But uh, this guy was Arab. And this was my first experience of working directly with an Arab. And uh, I'm going to tell you what, man. I don't know if he's representative of Arabs in general. This was one volatile individual. And uh, he, he scared me a couple of times, man. I, I tell you. But, I mean, an Arab, if you get him to be your friend, they could be your best friend. And I... Uh, I won't say that we became best friends, but we certainly weren't enemies. But there were times, I mean, he would just explode, man. I mean, you know, it's you. And, and what was weird was he had some sort of in with management because he could do things that and get away with it that nobody else could do, you know. And of course, it was one of those bad situations where management was looking to get rid of everybody that worked there and replace them. And of course, I was meant to be a replacement if i could cut it and so they were putting all these metrics on you so it was a it was kind of high pressure and you know and of course you know in the meantime you're watching this person get fired that person get fired this person get fired that person get laid off you know and you're thinking am i next am i next am i next and uh because you know i really needed that job at that time uh so anyway uh i just working i just wanted to tell the arab story because i thought it was pretty funny and uh and by the way he, he could grill really well. He he always carted barbecue, and that was a huge argument between him and, <laughs> and another guy that did get fired. Uh, he says, "You're not you're not barbecuing. You're grilling. There's a difference, you know." Said, it was it was funny as hell to watch them. They hated each other, man. They hated each other. And uh, like I said, the Arab uh, he had connections. He was never. I mean, I I never understood it because he really. No offense. He it, when I first got there, he really wasn't very good. At, at the job and uh, he was kind of like that guy Larry that I told you about uh, now he got he got good later on uh, you know you give a person enough time and enough leeway and of course I taught him a lot because what what I did you know it was one of those jobs where you just sit around because at first there was nothing going on with the build in the data center they had hired me in six months before things really got rolling so you know you're just sitting there at night but I said so what I would do and I think this is what pissed him off is I would go in and I would go into the, the equipment closet and I'd pull out the equipment and I would sit there all night long and I'd play with it and I would read the manual and I would go down and I would get some fiber and I would bring it up and I'd start learning. Because no, he, he pretended that he knew anything, but he never taught me anything. It was the same thing with that Unix administration job where the guy wouldn't teach me anything. So I was just learning about it on my own. Well, I, in his case... He didn't know anything. I didn't know. I thought he knew it. He just wasn't going to teach me. 
But, uh, and so he got really jealous about the fact that I'm learning how to fluke this and fluke that and use this test equipment and use that test equipment. So it was really a fantastic job. I mean, I, I like the physical aspect. I like the, uh, well, I didn't like the 12 to, to 12. I mean, in fact, we had another manager that came in and then we went six to six. And that really worked a lot better, especially for the night crew. You know, you start at 6 in the evening and you get off at 6 in the morning. And so, you know, you, you sleep till about 2 in the afternoon and you still have a life before you have to go back to work. Uh, but uh, anyway, they, they wanted that interaction between first shift and second shift. Uh, so they've switched it back to 12 to 12. And so what happened was, you know, I got... Uh, towards you know when I was at the peak of my career I was I was leading the team uh, and I was I was at the top of my game and everybody looked to me you know because we were bringing on all new people you know all the time and everybody was looking to me to teach them the ropes teach them what was going on and then boom all of a sudden my neck uh, swelled up and I uh, and I didn't know I thought it was the mumps or something you know and I remember uh, I went to a couple different doctors and they said, well, you know, maybe it's the mumps. We don't know. And uh, so finally, I, I, I don't know how I ended up with him, but I'll give you his name. It was Dr. Chang. Dr. Chang. Uh, and he was an asshole. <laughs> you want an asshole for a surgeon? I'm going to tell you right now, you want an asshole for a surgeon. But anyway, so uh, so I got into his office and he took one look at me and he says, uh, he says, well, and he never talked to me hardly. I mean, you know, it was weird. He was one of those doctors that, you know, he just looked at it and says, I know exactly what's going on here. He says, uh, he says, nurse uh, or his receptionist or whatever she was to him. He says, when can we get Mr. Ellis scheduled for surgery? Surgery? What the hell are you talking about? You know, I felt great. I mean, I, I was having night sweats. I didn't know why I was sweating so much, but I, you know, I didn't feel that bad. I just knew that something was wrong with all those, these, and of course my armpits were sore as hell. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, what's going on here? And, uh, and, and she goes, well, Monday. He says, yeah. He says, well, let's get it. I said, well, Doc, doc you know, I'm, of course, I'm following him around like a little puppy. <laughs> you know, tell me what's going on. What, what do you mean? What do you mean? He goes, he says, well, I'm going to cut that lymph node out of your neck. He says, and we're going to get it biopsied. Uh, he, and he says, I, I don't want to say more at this point. He says, but we're going to, well, you know, I need to check on something. I said, okay, all right. So, of course, I went in and the biopsy came back and I had, B cell, non Hopkins lymphoma cancer. Uh, end of my career. That was it. And uh, so, you know, of course, it was funny because I wonder what that doctor thought. Because I, I went back to him 13 times for surgery after that. Uh, I won't detail all the surgeries. I think I told that story in a different video. But uh, I just can't imagine because he, I, you know, as a surgeon, I mean, even at some point, he's got to say, how many times am I going to cut? on Mr. Ellis, you know, <laughs> he made more money off of me because I had insurance, you know, than, than probably any other patient in his entire career, you know, uh, so it was, uh, it was brutal, and we got the, uh, we got the cancer into remission the first time, and so then I went back to work, and now things, you know, it was about eight months, ten months later, and things had advanced way beyond, I mean, imagine, you know, you were the top dog, now I'm the bottom dog, and, uh, and so I was struggling to keep up, you know, to learn, you know, because they had established procedures and, you know, everybody knew what they were doing. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, of course, I, you know, I'm still kind of uh, beat up from the chemotherapy. And, uh, and I, so I was having a hard time keeping up. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, but I was, I, I, I actually got back into the swing. I was doing a great job. I would have stayed there I, I, and, and kept on with that. But then the, the cancer came back a second time. Boom, damn it, ended my career again. So now this time it was much more serious ball game. If anybody who's had cancer, you know, the first round, generally they can fight it down, but the second round, in fact, I went into the doctors. I, so now I'm with Carmanos, which is in down, downtown Detroit, and a whole new batch of doctors, and uh, they're a lot more skilled than, than what I went through. Can't tell you the whole story. I don't want to bore you with it. Uh, that, that, like I said, different video for that. Uh, but, uh, they, you know, they gave me, they brought me in. They said, well, you know, you only got a 40% chance of surviving the procedure that we're going to do. Uh, do you want to proceed or do you just want to die? I said, well, I, you know, I, I want to proceed. I said, but what about that, uh, that clinical trial up on the wall there? Oh, that, yeah. Uh, I don't know. He says, I think that's full up. I said, well, hell, if I'm going to die, I'd, I'd like for you guys to be able to learn something, you know, so that maybe somebody else can be helped. 
he says he says well let me check he says maybe we can get you in on that clinical trial and so they they finally got back to me and and he says uh, i don't know i think it wasn't him it was, there was a, by the way the way carmanos did it and this is the way all medical operations should work was you get assigned uh, an advocate and i want to call him an advocate they're the person that handles your interaction between you and the doctors and of course they're there to answer all your questions so you got one person one person that you go to for everything and i'm going to tell you that streamlines everything you know because her name was anita and man was she good at what she did and so uh, she came in and she says you're in luck not sure it's a good thing but you're in on the clinical trial <laughs> said, uh, well pretty cool you know i said it turns out that clinical trial saved my life last person to get in you want to talk about the luckiest human being on the planet i mean i've survived the broken neck with i told you that story you know i've been to war and back you know survived cancer twice uh you know i mean you name it man. 13 well let's see 28 car accidents uh i'd say about 18 different surgeries perforated bowels uh stabbed shot at never actually got shot um so anyway it's uh I just I digress I digress <laughs> so, so then you know I get into uh, writing the book and this is the, the reason I want to tell this story again is because of Edward Snowden and uh, I was uh, I had everything in the book that I wanted about I'd say late 2013 I was ready to publish now I we could do a whole series of videos on all the mistakes I made trying to start a small business I'll give you just two examples real quick is did you know that if you hire somebody to do your website, and especially if they register the domain in their name, I think I said this in previous videos, they own your website and they own your domain. You have to buy it from them, even though you paid them to do the website. I didn't know that, and so I, that cost me a lot of money. And then the next one, which didn't cost me a lot of money, but it's just something for you to know, I hired an artist to do all of my artwork. I'm going to tell you, working with an artist is tough, man. They, uh, they, they're more into just... I'm on my guitar today. I, 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 do Jacob, you made any work progress on that artwork? Uh, no, not today, man. Not today. I, I just been busy, you know. And uh, I'll get to it uh, maybe next week or something, you know. Well, that's fine, you know, because I'm still writing the book, and it's probably going to be a while before I need that artwork. But you know, I, I just like to start seeing some progress. You know, this went on <laughs> for, for some, almost the whole five years that I was writing the book. Uh, thank God it took me five years to write the book. I wouldn't have my artwork. But anyway, the, the, the moral of the story is is you have to have the artist sign over the artwork to you. Okay, otherwise he owns the artwork. Even though I paid him to do the artwork, you don't own your own artwork. Okay, unless you do it yourself. And so that's what I learned. You know, you, if you're going to start a small business, unfortunately, you got to learn how to do a website yourself. You got to learn how to be an artist. Uh, of course, I didn't. I, I just I had an artist that would sign the artwork over to me. A lot of artists won't do that. A lot of artists say, you know, nope, that's my artwork. You know, so you got to be careful who you hire to do your artwork. Uh, so that's uh, that was another huge story. And uh, let's just keep going. So so now here I am. I'm ready to publish. And boom, the Edward Snowden bomb cell, bombshell drops. <laughs> I was like, what the hell? Oh my God. So I'm reading about his journey. I'm writing, and of course, I'm writing as furiously as I can. I said, I've got to incorporate this into the book. I mean, talk about the greatest cybersecurity uh, you know, scandal. I mean, this uh, movies, well, they did make a movie about it, you know. I mean, mo I said, movies are going to be made about this. I've got to capture as much detail about what's, what happened, what he's done, you know, his saga. As I possibly can and of course my ex-wife she's going well I thought you were ready to publish I said well he just blew the book up she goes what do you mean I said well I, I, there was I said there were things that I had in the book that were wrong or not wrong but you know I, I can expand on them now number one I said number two there's things that I see that I need to add to the book because uh, uh, you know the, the techniques that he employed I hadn't written about it that at that point in time uh, and then you know one 
in the meantime, as you know, as you as you do this, things are changing. You know, when you're writing a technical book, you know, step by step, those step by step instructions are changing on a daily basis. So I'm constantly going back and rewriting chapters as I as I'm adding chapters and I'm adding, you know, uh, Operation Muscle, you know, Operation Ant, you know, I, you know, these are all um, NSA operations. Uh, you know, collect it all, process it all. I mean, it was just it was like one thing after another. You know, I mean, so for example, I mean, nobody knew that the NSA was tapped into the fiber backbones of the of the big tech companies, and that they were siphoning off everything that goes through those those uh, fiber optic lines, uh, so that they could uh, process it and know what every American was doing, and they were storing the information. So let's get into to this story because now you know, now things are changing in the book. So here's one example, and I'll finish off the video right here because I know I got a little long-winded here. A lot of Americans don't know that 28 si miles outside of Salt Lake City is the largest data center in the entire world. I mean, this thing makes a banking data center look like a freaking anthill. Now, when you think about a banking data center, it takes four or no, six, six tractor trailer diesel side generators to run that data center. The data centers, I'll give you an example. I don't know how many data, somebody wrote the statistic, but like let's just say four banking data centers use more or produce more carbon. I mean, if you want to be a, a climate change freak, you know, go protest the data centers. <laughs> they produce more carbon than all the airplanes in the world, in the world do in a year. Four, maybe four. I can't give you the exact number. I'd have to have my book in front of me. So imagine, imagine the carbon footprint of a, the NSA data center. That's the biggest, by far, data center in the world. The power requirements. It must have its own nuclear power plant. I'm gonna. I, that's my guess. Otherwise, I don't see how they can they can pay for the for the uh, for the, the electricity. I mean, good God, the electric bill would just be astronomical. And the American people are paying for the NSA to, to collect everything about us and spy on us. And I'm just surprised that there's not pitchforks and knives <laughs> around it. Of course, for miles, you can't get within miles of that data center. I mean, you know, and and people are, I'm pretty sure people have been arrested trying to get in there to, it's kind of like Area 51, you know, same, same principle. You know, they, they don't want people anywhere near it. So I can understand that you can't protest, but, but you know, at least you get, go to Salt Lake City and you can do a protest in the city, you know, and, and, and bring, bring, highlight the fact that there's this, this monstrous spying facility that we as taxpayers are paying for. We're paying for our own demise. <laughs> I mean, it blows my mind. <laughs> and nobody cares. Nobody cares, but I care. And I hope you care. So anyway, get down that free copy of my book and learn, learn how to keep the NSA from collecting everything about you. I teach you how to do that. Learn how to protect yourself from the corporations that are spying on you. I teach you how to do that. Learn how to protect yourself from that scorned lover or that ex-wife that might just be uh, spying on you. You know, I teach you how to do that. Learn how to protect yourself from hackers. Now, I'll give you a good hacking story. Okay, so as I was writing the book, you know, I wanted to see, because I'm, I'm in Dearborn, Michigan at this time. I wanted to see how many people were scratching up against my router trying to get into my home network. Okay, so I turned logging on, on my router. Now, I, I encourage you to do this as an experiment too. Of course, my book teaches you how to do this. So you can go into a router, turn on logging, and it'll start logging. You know everything all the activity that you want to know about now you can pick different categories you know you check different boxes i just says you know how many people are trying to probe my router it was phenomenal it was phenomenal i was like are you kidding me how i mean don't these people have better things to do i mean and a lot of it was coming from china you know and i'm like son of a because i'm recognizing these ip addresses. i'm like what the hell Look at all these people trying to break into them. I'm just, and I'm just, think of it. I'm a nobody. <laughs> I mean, you know, but, but I'm, I was, of course I'm, but I'm well protected. You know, I had shut my router down completely. You know, things that you need to learn about, like address reservations, or you can actually configure your router so that you have the MAC addresses uh, in your, in your router so that no, no device 
anywhere in the world can connect to your router other than the devices that you designate. Now that's a pain in the ass because I'm going to tell you I ran into it a couple of times because you know like like my grandson or my step grandson he comes in and I had you know I had the guest network broadcasting and I'm sure you might have a guest network on your router and he couldn't connect and I was I'd forgotten you know because I'd, I'd locked that router down big time and uh, I said well, why can't he connect the, you know the guest network he should be oh I hadn't put the MAC address for his phone <laughs> in the router. <laughs> Oh, so yeah, so it can cause some pain. You buy a new TV, you got to put that MAC address in the router if you're going to be using that. You know, and what's an address reservation? Address reservation just means that your printer keeps the same IP address within your network. Because uh, I was running into every time the, the router would assign a new IP address to the printer, the printer would quit working. <laughs> so I had to, had to make a, an address reservation so that it, it would always get the same IP address. So the, I teach you about all these things in my book. You know, setting up your, your SSID. You know, do you want it to broadcast or not? I had problems not allowing it to broadcast. And I'll be honest, I, I got mine broadcasting now. And you know what my handle is? Trump! 2024 that gets broadcast all over my neighborhood i love it i love it so i change your sid if you got a router so that everyone because everybody think about it get on your phone you're going to connect to a wireless network if everybody's network was broadcasting trump 2020 24 i think that would be great <laughs> all right so i guess i'll shut up right there so peace out and stay free but i hope you number one watch the interview because i think you're going to learn a lot uh although if you've been following along on my videos there's not a lot I'm going to talk about in this interview that I haven't already talked about in most of my videos, although each day I'm reading my book trying to get my brain back. You know, I haven't read my book since, well, I mean, I don't know about you, I don't read my own book. <laughs> Unless it's a reference for, for something else that I'm doing. I haven't had to reference the book because the, the business shut down, and of course I had to move to Florida in 2017. So, all right, so that's it, man. Peace out, stay free, and the good news is, you know everything about my career now. You don't have to watch another single video about my career. We're just going to be making geopolitical videos from this point on and hiking videos. I'm going to get back into that and maybe a few cybersecurity videos where I can teach you some things about cybersecurity. Peace out. Stay free.